Good morning, everyone. Back to the Great Horn Spoon, Chapter 8, Saved by a Whisker. In his pea jacket and stocking cap, Jack felt 14 years old at least, maybe 15. He stood in the bow of the whale boat and watched the long wharf come closer. They bumped against the boat stairs and Jack was the first out. His heart raced with excitement of the moment. They had arrived and he was ready to start digging. Not so fast, Master Jack, said Praiseworthy. Don't forget your pick and shovel and don't start digging up the streets, laughed Mountain Jim. Folks might not appreciate it. A hilltop telegraph had signaled the arrival of the sidewheeler, and now it seemed as if all of San Francisco had turned out. The wharf was alive with men, women, and children, not to mention dogs, mules, and chickens. Seagulls flocked in the air like confetti. Weighted down with their belongings, Praiseworthy and Jack started along the wharf. There were barrels and boxes piled everywhere. Peddlers and hawkers and hotel runners mixed through the crowd and shouted at the newcomers, Welcome, boys! Welcome to the fastest-growing city in the world! Flannel shirts for sale! Red flannel shirts, gents! These don't show the dirt! Try Ni Niantic Hotel, the cleanest beds in town! Horn spoons! You'll need them at the diggins carved from genuine ox horn! Stay at the Parker House, none better. The wharf seemed a mile long and the noisiest place on earth. Jack was dazzled by what he saw, tattooed islanders and East India sailors and silent Chinese with pigtails dangling behind them like black chains. There were Mexicans moving about to the jingle of their heavy silver spurs and Chileans in long serapes. There were mule skinners and businessmen, and there were miners in jackboots and red flannel shirts, with the mud of the digging still in their beards. The city rang to the sound of hammers. Buildings were going up everywhere, and a sand dredger was pounding the air. Men stood in the doorways of the shops ringing handbells. Auction! Auction going on! Fresh eggs just arrived from Panama! Step inside, gents, cheroots and chewing tobacco. Onions at auction. Fifty bushels just come in from the Sandwich Islands. Also, calomel pills, castor oil, and carpet tax. Jack gazed about at the street of wonders. There was a smell of mutton from the chop houses and a sizzle of hot grease from the oyster shops. Suddenly, Mountain Jim stopped short. Billy be hanged, he said, lifting his nose in the air. Smell that? Praiseworthy nodded. It's strong enough to knock a man down. Makes your mouth water, don't it? Not exactly, said Jack, trying not to breathe. It's bear meat, real California home cooking. Good luck in the diggings, boys. I'm going to follow my nose. Following up the scent like a bloodhound, Mountain Jim crossed the street and turned into a restaurant. Before long, Mr. Azaria Jones dropped away, unable to resist the lure of the auction shops a moment, not a moment, excuse me, not about, unable to resist the lure of the auction shops another moment. Praiseworthy and Jack continued along the boardwalk, which was hammered together mostly out of barrel staves, and reached the United States Hotel. Captain Swain had recommended it. A fine room, if you please, Praiseworthy said to the hotel clerk, and I think a tub bath would be in order. Very good, sir, replied the clerk. He was a bald-headed man with a thin strand of hair combed sideways from ear to ear. That'll be ten dollars extra each. What's that? Praiseworthy scowled. We don't want to bathe in champagne. Water will do, sir. Champagne be almost cheaper, gents. Water's a dollar a bucket. Unless you want to wait until next November, prices come down after it starts rain. Wait, we'll wait, said Praiseworthy with decision. In this part of the world, he thought, a man had to strike it rich just to keep his neck clean. He signed the register and Jack gazed at a bearded miner pacing back and forth across the lobby floor. 
He wore a floppy hat and chestnut hair tumbling out on all sides like mattress stuffing coming loose. He kept glancing at the loud wall clock as if every advancing second might be his last. Jack couldn't take his eyes off the man. Tucked in his wide leather belt were a revolver, a horn spoon, and a soft buckskin bag. Gold dust, Jack thought. He must have just got in from the mines. Ruination, the miner began to mutter. Ruination. Praiseworthy blotted the register. How, he asked the clerk, does one get to the mines? Riverboat leaves every afternoon at four o'clock from the Long Wharf. Fare to Sacramento City is $25. From there, you make your way to the diggings by stage, mule, back, or foot. Jack shot a glance at Praiseworthy. $25 each? Why, they didn't have that much money, but the butler didn't so much as raise an eyebrow. We'll be taking the boat tomorrow, he told the clerk. Ruination, said the miner. Come along, Master Jack, said Praiseworthy. The walls of their room were lined with blood-red calico, and there was china matting on the plank floor. The window looked out on the shipping in the bay, the mast as thick as a pine forest. There were not only gold ships, but navy frigates and Chinese junks and the going and comings of longboats. But Jack wasn't interested in the view. Fifty dollars just to get to Sacramento City, he said. We'll have to walk. Good exercise, no doubt, but we haven't time for it. Praiseworthy gazed out at the distant hills across the bay. Sacramento City was more than a hundred miles up, no up river, he had heard, and the diggings in the foothills beyond that. Let me see. It took us five months to get this far, and it'll take us another five months to get home. If we are to keep your Aunt Arabella from being sold out, we have two months left, two months to fill our pockets with nuggets. Jack found himself pacing back and forth like the miner in the lobby below. Ruin nation, Jack said. We've come all this way, and now we're no closer. Nonsense, said Praiseworthy. There was a pitcher half filled with water on the chest, and he poured a small amount into the wash pan. We'll be on tomorrow's river boat, I promise you. Now then, I suggest we wash up as the best we can, Master Jack. Wash? Jack thought. There wasn't time to wash. How will we pay the fare? Let me see. We have $38 left. That's a start, isn't it? Of course, we'll have our room and meals to pay. But if I detect one thing in the air, it's opportunity. The sooner you wash, Master Jack, the sooner we can tend to our financial dilemma. Your Aunt Arabella wouldn't allow you abroad on the streets with dirty ears and sea salt in your eyebrows, and don't forget the soap. Ruin nation, Jack muttered again. He might as well be home in Boston. They washed and changed into fresh clothes, and Praiseworthy gathered up their fine linen, their fine white linen shirts. They needed a good starching and ironing. Praiseworthy had noticed a laundry sign a few doors from the hotel. It wouldn't do, he told himself, to see Master Jack turn into a rough ragamuffin. No, indeed, Miss Arabella would never forgive me. When they returned to the lobby, the shaggy miner was still there, pacing and muttering in his dusty beard. He glanced at Jack, a dark sudden glance, and then the butler, and then the boy went out on the street. But as they ambled along the boardwalk, Jack began to realize that the miner was following them. Or so it seemed for a moment. Praiseworthy turned into the laundry, a mere wooden framework tacked with canvas, and set the bundle of shirts on the counter. How soon may we have these back, sir? asked the butler. Very fast service, answered the laundryman. His pigtail bobbed as he bowed. How fast? Three months, unless there is a typhoon. Three months? Typhoon? The man was mad, Praiseworthy thought, or perhaps it was the entire city. We fully intend to leave by the four o'clock riverboat tomorrow. Not possible, said the Chinese, bowing and slipping his hands into his flowing sleeves. We send laundry to China. It come back three, four months, all wash, starch, iron, unless there is a typhoon, take longer. No one do laundry here. Everything sky high. Cheaper send to China. Praiseworthy picked up the bundle of shirts and gave Jack a look of modest defeat. 
Since we've managed without our baths, I dare say we do without starch shirts. Come along. They had hardly gone half a block when Jack saw the miner in the floppy hat once again behind them. The black pistol in his belt suddenly looked larger. But Jack said nothing. The miner could not, could want nothing from them. Nothing at all. He was still at their heels when the butler and the boy crossed the street. Now Jack was beginning to feel anxious, even a little scared. Finally, he looked up at Praiseworthy. He's following us. Who's following us? asked the butler. The miner from the hotel. Stuff and nonsense. The streets are free to everyone. But he's following us, Praiseworthy. Nothing to fear in broad daylight, Master Jack. They continued along the sandy plaza, still looking for opportunity, and the miner marched right behind them. Must be another madman, said Praiseworthy, turning. He stopped, and the miner stopped, and they stood face to face. Sir, said the butler, are you following us? Ruination, I sure am. I'll thank you to go on your way, sir. No offense, gents, the miner said. Been on the verge of breaking in on your conversation, but it didn't seem courteous. It was hard to see his mouth for the fullness of his beard. They call me Quartz Jackson, and I just come in from the diggings. My fiancé's due in on the stage any minute, coming up from the capital at Monterey. We ain't never met, but we writ a lot of letters, and that's just it. And that's just what, said Praiseworthy. We're supposed to be getting married. But ruination, when she takes one look at me, she's going to think I'm a part grizzly bear. He whipped off his floppy hat and his dusty hair fell out on all sides. She'll get right back on stage for Monterey. But shucks, I ain't such a bad looking gent, leastways, I wasn't when I went to the diggings. I'm just a mite growed over, you might say. Well, I've been tramping every street in town looking for a barber, but they all lit out for the mines. Don't seem to be anyone left here but the cheap johns. Cheap johns? said Praiseworthy. Auctioneers. Anyway, that's why I couldn't help staring at the lad here. Me? said Jack. Why, that yellow hair of yours looks fresh from the barber shop, all cut and trimmed. I figured you must have flushed out a barber, and maybe you'd do Quartz Jackson a favor of leading me to him. If Jack had feared the miner for a moment, he couldn't help smiling at him now. He liked the man. No, sir, he said. I haven't been to a barber, and yes, unless you mean praiseworthy. Praiseworthy? At your service, said the butler. It's true. I've been cutting Master Jack's hair, but only out of necessity. The miner's face, what could have been seen of it, broke into a sunny smile. I'd be much obliged if you'd... Barber me up, Mr. Praiseworthy. Name your price. I'm not a barber, sir. I'm a butler. A what? I couldn't accept any money for merely... Well, now, that's mighty white of you. Tell you what I'll do. I'll let you have all the hair you cut off. Praiseworthy and Jack exchanged fresh glances. The man was some sort of lunatic, after all. What earthly use did they have for the man's shorn locks? But it seemed wise to humor him, and Praisley said, I'll be glad to help you in honor of your need, sir. Consider it a modest wedding present. Twenty minutes later, the miner was seated on a nail keg in a corner of the hotel porch, and Praiseworthy was snipping away with the shears. Quartz Jackson insisted that every lock be caught as it fell. Jack was kept busy holding a wash pan under Praiseworthy's busy scissors. It worried him that time was wasted and they were yet to make their boat fare. But he knew it would have been impossible for Praiseworthy to turn his back on a gentleman in distress, even a peculiar miner like Mr. Quartz Jackson. My, ain't the town growed, though, said the miner. Must be all of four or five thousand folks in the place. You gents figuring on going to the diggings? We do indeed, said Praiseworthy. I come from Hangtown. The boys have been locating a good lot of color up that way. Color? The yeller stuff, gold. If you get up Hangtown way, tell them you're a friend of Quartz Jackson. Tell them I'll be coming home with my bride in a couple weeks. Sure is nice of you to shear me this way. Would you mind trimming the beard while you're at it? Always itching, and I can hardly find my mouth to spit with. 
Jack, young Jack, a bit of sideburn is getting away in the breeze. Wouldn't want you to lose any. Yes, sir, Jack said, catching the locks of hair. Quartz Jackson's face began to appear, snip by snip, like a statue being chipped out of stone. When Praiseworthy had finished, the miner turned to look at himself in the hotel window pane, and he almost jumped out of his jack boots. By the great horn spoon, he said, is that me? Quartz Jackson was obviously pleased. Why, I'd forgot I was so young. Quartz Jackson was a fine-looking gent at that, Jack thought. He had good teeth and an easy smile. Except for his revolver, his horn spoon, and his red flannel shirt, he hardly seemed the same man. But what did he expect them to do with the hair cuttings? Stuff a mattress? Your fiancé will be very pleased, smiled Praiseworthy. Our congratulations on your forthcoming marriage, sir. Much obliged, Praiseworthy. You saved me from certain ruination. The least I can do is learn you how to work a gold pan. Water boy, you there, fetch us a bucket of dew over here. The miner paid for the water by taking a pinch of fine gold dust from his buckskin pouch. Jack was eager, eager to get the hang of mining, and Quartz Jackson, peculiar or not, was clearly an expert. Sorry, guys. I don't want her eating my plants. Let's see. Give me the wash pan, Jack, young Jack. Jack handed over the tin pan piled high with chestnut whiskers and trimming. The miner went, wet them down with fresh water and began to swish the pan around. Gold's heavy, he explained. Nothing heavier. Even the yellow... Dust sinks to the bottom if you keep work in the pan like this. Then he handed the wash pan to Jack and taught him the motion. The water turned brown from the dirt and mud that had gathered in Court Jackson's whiskers and hair. Finally, he poured off everything, everything but a thin residue at the bottom of the pan. Jack's eyes opened like blossoms. Gold dust. Why, look there, the miner roared with laughter. The boys panned himself some color. I figured I'd scratched enough pay dirt with my beard to assay out about $14 an ounce. Since I give you the whiskers and all, the gold is yours. Jack had never known a more exciting moment in his life. The grains of dust sparkled like yellow fire, and there was even a flake or two. Half an hour later, while Quartz Jackson was having a $10 tub bath, Praiseworthy and Jack were plucking opportunity from the air. They put up a sign that said, free haircuts, minors only. And that is the end of chapter eight. Check back with me when we read chapter nine. See you guys later.